Right. So um, our next presentation uh, is by Emma Campman. Uh, Emma's uh, thesis title is Performing Power, The Gender Dimensions of Populist Leadership. Uh, Emma's uh, project was sponsored by Lita Sizer and Matthew Ellis, and Lita Sizer is Emma's Dawn. So Emma, hello. Hello. <laughs> all right. Hey, Hi, I'm everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's um, really exciting to be able to hear about everyone's amazing work. I feel really honored to be in this group with and presenting my, my work as well. So I sort of wrote a hybrid history and politics thesis this year that really looks at the intersections between gender performance and also populist leadership. And I was really lucky to have gotten to work with Matthew Ellis and Lita Sizer as my two sponsors for this project. Um, and they were both incredibly helpful and supportive throughout the whole process. So I wanna say a huge thank you to them. Thank you both of, thank you, both of you for being here and for helping me so much. Um, so my thesis is called Performing Power, The Gender Dimensions of Populist Leadership, as Danny just said. Um, and I'm gonna jump straight in because I have not that much time to talk to you all. So my thesis used gender as a primary lens through which to study successful leadership models of prominent populist leaders throughout the 20th and 21st century. Um, this piece works to analyze the ways in which gender acts as sort of a crucial social catalyst within populist movements internationally and we'll focus specifically on the gendered ideas that promote the representation and performance of masculinity and femininity as it is associated with political strength. Within the discussion of gender performance, I wanna really clearly acknowledge that there's not simply a binary, though this thesis focuses primarily on the performance of masculine and feminine traits within a socio-political context. It really doesn't infer in any way that this reductive and yet highly utilized binary is the only way of understanding the performance of gender. So I just want to say that really clearly. Um, so with that said, I um, look carefully at examining the underlying presence of gender conventions and performances within populist movements. And I think that this offers a crucial perspective through which to explore the parameters of this socio-political process. So though populism may vary in its political affiliation and agenda, there are a few underlying models of leadership and systems of asserting power that really remain consistent throughout different sociocultural regions. I argue that these models rely in part on the power of internalized gender conventions that remain present within societies transnationally. To fully examine this idea, I use a comparative analysis of two case studies. So the first, I look at the platforms and gendered models of governance that are used by Juan and Eva Perón in Argentina, and then second, um, of Nasser in Egypt. Within each case study, I look at the sociocultural and also the historical conditions that led to each of these leaders' respective successes. And once I've laid out the necessary context, I try to examine them in relationship to one another and consider the complexity of this cross-cultural comparison. And I think, that sort of just means looking at the looking at these two cases side by side and what do what does this analysis really tell us about this kind of cross cultural comparison. Um, and in this way, I try to critically engage the intersection between political theory and gender theory in order to explore new ways of discussing the foundational structures of populist leadership. Um, building off these ideas that I've presented, I argue that the underlying pro process that populist leaders employ to assert power relies on their ability to access the population's emotive realities, to assess them, and then to effectively perform a set of internalized cultural assumptions. Doing this creates a powerful cultural persona that people are able to then um, project their socialized understandings of power and authority onto. Though the acceptance of this cultural persona, through the acceptance of this cultural persona, people often start to subliminally associate parts of their emotional well being with this leader's narrative. I argue that this creates a, a sort of sense of socially embedded trust that establishes a complex set of power dynamics that are not necessarily tied to a leader's political actions, but rather to their cultivated social persona. This is not to say that populist leaders are necessarily explicitly aware of the ways in which they're manipulating these complex emotional narratives, only that these dynamics are being effectively utilized, be it conscious or not, to create a sense within the populace of emotional security that is then tied to this political figure. I believe that successful populism is really culturally specific. Every country or region's social norms are unique and hold their own historical importance when thinking about the development of political power. 
in this way, gender convention as a social construction must also be seen um, as fluid and culturally specific. This thesis doesn't try to make any sort of like sweeping statements about universal gender tropes. Instead, it highlights different social norms regarding gender performance in order to show that regardless of historical expectations of gender, it remains a heavily relied upon social structure that is subliminally associated with people's conceptions of trust and power. This makes it a really crucial tool for populist leaders in any socio-political context. I think that ultimately, my thesis is really arguing that populism, that with populism on the rise, as we can see here in the United States right now, um, it's becoming increasingly necessary for political theorists to begin more directly addressing the gender dimensions of populist leadership transnationally. Thank you, thank you so much. That's a quick summation of my thesis. Great, thank you, Emma. I mean, that, that, that sounds just like an amazing project. Oh, I see Matthew's coming on. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'll let uh, Matthew and Lita uh, go ahead and ask questions or offer a perspective. Oh, Lita, I believe you're on mute. So I hope you don't mind me calling you Maine. I, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> So can you tell these uh, people about the kind of genealogy of this project, how you came to um, choose the case studies you did and a little bit of your, about your process because it was, you know, hugely ambitious and now just regularly ambitious, right? Totally. <laughs> um, so initially I was gonna do three case studies and I was going to, I was gonna look at Argentina and Egypt and then kind of aggressively pivot to look at the United States. Um, and this sort of presented a lot of issues, primarily in terms of like, I'm working with two historians and periodization is really important in, <laughs> in history. Um, and so I think that when I was trying to understand these processes that I was discussing in the cases of Egypt and Argentina, which have a lot there, though they're very, very different, have a lot of sort of interesting connections that can be made because they're happening in a very similar, um, the Nasser and the Perones are sort of within the same time period and um, are part of this like big kind of cultural swing that's happening internationally during that time. And Trump is also, Trump is a totally different period, a totally different political sort of um, agenda and affiliation. He's a right-wing populist, as the other two are left-wing populists. And so it was, I was having a really hard time kind of figuring out how I was gonna make the claims that I was making. And so I decided to sort of shift my approach and use, um, use Nasser and the Perones as my primary case studies and then frame my study with sort of contemporary view of how, where populism has gone and how we can see gender continuing to play out um, in the context of the United States. So sh should I jump in? <laughs> So, I mean, it's been a real delight to work with Maeve on this project and to see it take shape over the course of the year. And of course, I'm always, you know, delighted when a student wants to do more research on Gamal Abdel Nasser, right, of all people. Um, and the, the idea to look at him from a gendered perspective is brilliant because it's just, it's so patent and, and so ripe for study and yet no one has really been doing that kind of work on him. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's really exciting. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us all about sort of just your impressions of watching watching him deliver his speeches, right? So, so you know, you were talking before about gender performativity, which of course, you know, is contingent on this concept of embodiment. And sort of what does Nasser embody when he, when, he speech, when he speaks? What do people see in him from a gender perspective when he's giving these marathon two hour, three hour orations in the 50s? Totally. I mean, I think that that was one of the most fascinating parts of the whole project because I had all, I got all of these primary documents, a lot of them um, sort of televised speeches and had took a long time to get them all translated, but having the translation and then seeing him sort of put on this sort of incredible performance of kind of a, a, a father figure to Egypt is a really, a really powerful thing. And I think that it, um, it's honestly, it was, it's very moving to see these performances um, 
because and I and I understand the ways in which they are they sort of create these coercive emotional experiences for people because he really does call on this idea of Egypt as a family, Egypt and himself as the father of this family. He also implements this really interesting kind of like conversational voice that gives him a sense of like commonality with the people, which I think is really powerful as well. Um, and I think in general, his whole demeanor is one that is designed to make you feel simultaneously totally understood and also completely comfortable, which is, um, and I think he does it incredibly effectively. I, like without even, you know, with my sort of um, cursory knowledge of, of him and sort of Egyptian society during that period was, was also able to sort of feel and the way that he stirs people's emotions. I think it's, it's yeah, really powerful work that he does. Mm -hmm. So, so one more question on methodologies. What do you think was the greatest challenge of doing the comparison between the Perones and Nasser? I think that, um, that, well, there's a lot of challenges because they are in really, really different contexts. And I think acknowledging the difference is probably the most important part of the comparative analysis because, um, because it's otherwise, I think, it's a huge simplification of two places that are so, um, that have such a rich, cultural and political history. Um, that being said, I think that probably the most difficult aspect to reconcile was the role of religion in both contexts. I think that um, religion is a really, really uh, prominent force, both in Argentina and in Egypt. And so to sort of figure out the ways that that kind of interacts with perceptions of gender, and also the way that that has then become politicized within the society is, um, is a really important consideration and is also difficult because Catholicism and Islam are, um, are, two, are two very different sort of uh, religious structures that, and that play themselves out differently in, in, in these two different um, cultures. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, that, that was really wonderful. Really appreciate your time and and, uh, and your, your ability to, to provide a, a concise summary of, I think, what is some fairly, very intricate and um, um, uh, challenging work to decipher. So thank you thank so you much. So. I really appreciate it. Great. Good, good.